Hey everyone. So we got the uh, got the results of the Comar Brunton uh, survey Q and A back today, and I have to say they're not looking good. I've put some timestamps below, but uh, right at the end there's uh, there's a little section where the uh, the presenter goes into how they're going to use these uh, results of these uh, this drone survey and. Uh, yeah, let's just say that it's not consistent with what they actually got in the survey and they have been clearly planning to introduce registration, remote ID, compulsory GPS and geofencing and uh, an expensive training um, rather than just a competency assessment, a competency assessment uh, all the way back at the start of the whole process. This was just, the survey was just an excuse to, uh, to, to push forward with their agenda no matter what it came out with, they were going to say what they're going to say. So I'll, I'll timestamp that down the bottom, but essentially if they put in remote ID, uh, compulsory geofencing and all the other requirements, registration and so forth, that will kill freestyle FPV dead. Uh, there's, just, there's just no way to comply. So anyway, and enjoy the footage. I sure didn't. For the Civil Aviation Authority as a regulator, understanding the participants of any sector is vital. The more we know, the better chance we have of achieving our collective goal of safe and secure skies. And this is for all users. So from users of drones themselves to the people out there, to a passenger boarding an international flight, to someone being transported to hospital in a helicopter, to someone in a park or sporting event where drones are being used. We work in a reasonably closed aviation environment, which in the past has been used to largely knowing participants that we deal with. The drone space is one area where there's an increasingly unknown amount of pilots, each subject to civil aviation rules, and not all of them knowing that that's the case. Understanding enough about the sector that we regulate in order to work with participants is vital. And as a risk-based regulator, it's very important for us to know where we need to apply our resource. I say work with because we're lucky enough to be a regulator in a sector that we all want the same thing. We all want safe skies. That's why it's so important for us to first and foremost recognise the fact that we have the same goal. We're all working in the same system, but we all want the same thing. And I expect that everybody on the call today uh, would agree and want the same thing as us. The more we know, the more we can utilise what is, as a regulator, our most powerful and important tool, which is education. Because a significant portion of users in the drone space have little or in some cases no barriers of entry compared to other users such as pilots, agricultural operators, adventure aviators, then education is even more important for us. So for us today, it's about educating drone users, letting them know that they are pilots, they're subject to rules which are designed to keep the aviation system of which they play an important part safe. Well, the research has highlighted for us gaps in understanding and knowledge, and this is where we can best apply our resource to educate drone users about sharing the skies. Hence launching a few weeks ago, our Sharing the Skies campaign in line with the research from Colmar Brunton. So I'm very grateful that they're here today to be able to take us through the results of that research. So I'm gonna hand you over very shortly to Michael Dunn and Nikki Ryan Hughes. We're going to talk for about 40 minutes presenting the uh, the findings and then answer some pre-sent in questions um, for the half hour or so after that. And then Kirsty Hewlett, Deputy Chief Executive for Regulatory and Data with the Ministry of Transport is going to make some closing statements. Again, thank you very much. And uh, I do invite anybody who has any uh, comments or questions, they can contact me direct at the Civil Aviation Authority. Cheers. Uh, with Hi everybody, I'm technology. Michael Dunn from Colmar Runton in Wellington. Um, I worked with my colleague Nikki to conduct this research and produce the results. 
So to start with, what we're going to do is we're going to um, have a look at why we did the research and then how it was done before we actually get into the findings. So why we did the research? Well, Civil Aviation, MOT and MB felt there was a gap in knowledge um, with, with how drones were being used in New Zealand and how many drones there were. So with this bit of research, we were aiming to achieve the things on the right hand side of the slide there. So understanding the incidence of recreational and commercial drone use in New Zealand, the number and types of drones being used, how those drones are being used, what potential future uses people um, are, want to use drones for, knowledge and attitudes about drones and problems encountered around drone use and what if any action is taken when somebody encounters a problem. The research consisted of um, looking at three different groups of people. So we've got the New Zealand based recreational drone users. These are people who have flown a drone for a recreational purpose in the last six months, even if it's just once. So it's anybody over 15 who has flown a drone in the last six months for a recreational purpose. Now we had three, uh, two different sources of people for this particular group. So we did a sample of um, Colm Brunton's research panel, and we also had a open survey uh, where members of Model Flying New Zealand and also uh, Airshare were invited to take part, and those invitations were sent out via civil aviation. Now, our second group are New Zealand-based commercial drone users aged 15 and over. These are people who fly drones for commercial or scientific purposes or involved in the decision making for their organisation about drones. Uh, when we were looking through the questions, it seems to some people thought this definition was um, a little bit narrower than it actually is. So we looked at a very broad definition of commercial users. So for us, a commercial user is anybody or any organisation that is using a drone in the course of their business. So that might be um, a teacher who is flying a drone over um, a sports event, filming that event. Or it might be a real estate agent who's taking some photos of a house, or it might be an accommodation provider who is taking some photos of their accommodation so those photos can appear on their website. So it's a very broad definition. It's not just those people who are making money out of the operation of a drone. And we had three different sources of the commercial drone users. Uh, we did a telephone survey, so a random sample of New Zealand businesses. Uh, and we asked people uh, whether they used a drone or not. We had a, um, an online sample using our business research panel. And again, we had um, that open link that was sent to members of Model Flying New Zealand and Airshare users. And the third and final group are our non-drone users. So these are people who haven't used a drone in the last six months. And these people were sourced from Coma Brunton's research panel. Uh, on this slide, this is the definition that we showed to people of drones in the online questionnaires. So we want to make sure everybody was thinking about the same thing when we're talking about drones. So this is the definition we showed people. Uh, small powered aircraft that are remotely controlled by somebody on the ground. So that ranges from larger aircraft, model aircraft that you can see on the left, to the teeny tiny little handheld one in the middle. So it's a big range of aircraft. This isn't the first survey we've conducted about drones. We actually did one in 2017 for civil aviation. Uh, this was quite different to the current one. Uh, and on this table, what we've done is we've looked at what the, the, the differences are between the two. So the primary focus of the two was quite different. So the 2017 one included overseas recreational users. Um, whereas the 2019, 2020, the current one, there we have just focused on New Zealand-based users, but we've included commercial users. 
the drone user definition was quite different. So in the latest one, it's people have flown a drone in the last six months. The previous one was fly or own a drone, um, but no time frame was specified. Uh, 2017, we projected the number of users based on those who fly or own a drone, um, and we didn't specify a time frame. Um, what we've tried to do in the 2020 report is if you've looked at the appendix, there is a comparison between the number of users on a like by like basis between the two surveys or as close as we can get it. Um, 2019, 2020, the projected number of users was based for the recreational users was based on the percentage of flow in a drone more than once in the last six months. And we've projected that to the census population aged five to 74. And one of the questions we will answer in the second part of the presentation directly asks why that 74 limit? And so I'll address that at that stage. Um, commercial, an organisation has flown a drone within the last six months projected to the number of enterprises in New Zealand in 2019. And that excludes property operators, so that is um, the likes of landlords. Um, and then the projected number of drones. In this bit of research, recreational is projected based on household ownership and commercial is based on enterprises or businesses. And in 2017, we asked the question, but we didn't report on it because we only used it as a profiling variable. So that is a bit of a rundown on why and how we did the research. Now we'll get into some of the results and also a bit more of the um, how we got to the results. So we'll start with incidents of drone use in New Zealand. So we used um, our panel survey, our Colmar Brunton Research Panel Survey to, to work out how many New Zealanders have used a drone for recreational purposes in the last six months. On the next slide, I'll go into exactly how that was done. Uh, but for now, we estimate there's 271,121 New Zealanders who have used a drone solely or mainly for recreational purposes in the last six months. And there are 156,610 drones used mainly for recreational purposes. Now, amongst those recreational users, uh, the highest incidence was men 30 to 39. And amongst drones themselves, uh, more than half are the very small drones weighing less than 500 grams. And you'll see there that there are more drone users than there are drones. That's because people say within a household or even friends are sharing drones. Because we have quite a broad definition of who a drone user is. So it's that twice in the last six months. So how did we calculate the number of drone users and drones in New Zealand? Uh, there was quite a bit of interest in this in the questions. Uh, so I'm gonna go into this in a little bit of depth and I apologize because I, I think it's probably a little bit dull but I'll go through it anyway, since there were so many questions um, asking how we did this. What we did to start with is we took a demographic sample of our um, a demographically representative sample from our research panel of New Zealanders. Um, so we structured that sample to be representative by age, gender, region, ethnicity, and household income. We then invited them to take part in an online survey and we asked them a whole bunch of questions to work out whether they had used a drone in the last six months. Then the proportion that we identified in that survey, we then um, multiplied that up by the number of New Zealanders aged 15 to 74 in the population. So 15 to 74, the 15 is because we didn't interview anybody under 15. The 74 was because in that initial sample, there was nobody who was over the age of 75 who flew a drone. That's not to say that within the survey that there aren't drone users who are over 75, there definitely are. And if you look at the age profile, you'll see that there are 
a lot of a relatively high incidence of drone users who are over the age of 60. But just in that initial sample where we work out how many people who are using drones are, it was just um, within that age group. Then to work out how many people who were under 15 who were using drones, as we asked people in the survey, is there anybody in your household who's under 15 who's also used a drone in the last six months? And then we divided that by the total number of people in their households who are under 15 to work out what proportion of the population under 15 are using a drone. And then we multiplied that by um, the total population uh, in that age group to give a total number of child users. And we had a, a cutoff at the bottom there of five because we needed it some age group where somebody is not going to be cognitively able to operate a drone. Then when it comes to working out how many recreational drones there are, that was simpler. So we took that information that we already had and we asked them how many drones their household owns. Uh, we then took the average number of drones owned and flown in the last six months. Uh, removed any outliers using the interquartile range method, which you can um, Google if you're interested in that method. Uh, and then we divided the population up in four different categories and then worked out how many people in each of those four categories or how many households in each of those four categories fly a drone. Uh, if you're wondering why we divide the population up into um, those four household types, is your drone incidence differs by those household types. So we want to make it as accurate as we could. Hopefully I haven't put too many people to sleep with that, that very long explanation. So if we turn now to commercial users, now remember this is a very broad definition of commercial use, including anybody who has used a drone in their business in the last six months. So we think there are nearly 8,000 New Zealand businesses, organisations who have used a drone in the last six months. And within those businesses, there are nearly 21,000 New Zealanders who have used a drone. And the number of drones they're using is 15,322. Uh, Again, I've included how we calculated the number of drone users um, because there was some interest in that. What we did uh, in terms of calculating the number of organisations is we got a sample of New Zealand organisations from Equifax, who are a business list supplier. Now, this is not a sample of drone users. This is a sample of all New Zealand businesses because what we're trying to work out is what the incidence is in the population. So our telephone interviewers called 1,690 of the organisations on the list and asked them questions to determine whether anyone in their organisation had used a drone in the last six months. Then we divided those 1,690 organisations into 39 separate groups um, that we created based on industry type and number of employees. The reason we did this is that initial sample was not representative of the population by industry or by business size. So whenever you're doing a survey of um, businesses in New Zealand, it's always it's a bit tricky because if you sample by business size, then you are over, you're getting a lot of very small businesses and you don't have enough in the large business category. Or if, you're in, if you sample by number of employees, you end up with a lot of businesses in the very large category, not very many in the small category. So we overcame that by doing a mixed sampling approach. And the way we brought that back to population was to create those 39 categories and then work out the incidents in each of those categories separately. And then we brought those all back then we projected each of the individual categories to the population and then we brought them all back together to produce a total number of organisations using a drone in New Zealand. And then the commercial drone user calculation was quite um, simple, very, very similar to the uh, recreational users. So we asked people how many people in the organisation used a drone. 
and then the number and we also asked them the number of commercial drones or drones that were used mainly for commercial purposes were in their organization in the last six months to give us the total number of drones okay. so let's have a look at some more results this is the incidence of drone use by organization so it's a percentage and does not reflect the size of each of the industries uh, we'll see we'll factor that in in the next slide so you'll see here that information media and telecommunication companies five percent of those have used a drone in the last six months um, 3.5 percent of public administering administration training and education organizations have used a drone in the last six months i think it might be helpful just to give you a flavor of who these drone users are um, just by describing some of the typical people we, who completed the survey so say within the agriculture and forestry category that might be a farmer or a horticulturist who's flying over their herd or their their crop just to check what it's like or where they are. Um, the public administration training and education group, that is quite often teachers who are using the drones uh, within their school premises. Um, it might be the sports event um, or it might be some kind of outdoor event. The retail, wholesale, accommodation and food services, a typical person there might be an accommodation provider who's using photos uh, from the drone of their premises that they can put on their website. Uh, your professional scientific and technical services, that's where your photographers sit. And so there's a lot of professional photographers who are using drones. Uh, construction, uh, we had quite a few builders who were using drones to fly over the buildings that they were building, um, particularly residential buildings, just to check uh, the quality of what was happening. Um, electricity, gas and water. Now that is a very small sector in terms of number of businesses, but they were doing things like um, flying drones to check um, electricity lines, that kind of thing. Your information media and telecommunications companies, um, that included the likes of advertising agencies who were using uh, drones to take photos for ads. Your rental hire and real estate companies, that that is your real estate agents typically and they are using drones to take photos of households okay so that's the incidence within each of those industries now if we factor in the size of each of those industries that's in this chart and you can see here that the numbers do change around a bit for instance because we have so many people in the agriculture and forestry sector um, while it's only a small percentage of the total, they're actually one of the larger groups when you look at it in terms of pure number of businesses. I won't dwell on that. Um, we asked people, the commercial operators, whether they were flying under part 101 or part 102 rules. Most said part 101 rules. Um, very few said part 102 rules only. There were a few people who didn't know and there were some people who said both. Now, what we saw later on in the survey is people did get confused about the rules they were flying under. So not all of the commercial operators, because we've got such a broad definition, understood the, the rules that they were flying under. So where are drones being used in New Zealand? The recreational users are typically flying over their own home or backyard. So we've got nearly 50% of the last flight um, over their own home or backyard. Um, we've got a few over the beach or a neighborhood park, um, nature reserves or a national park, that kind of thing. We also ask people what suburbs they had flown over on their last couple of flights. And the way we did this is we used statistical area two from Statistics New Zealand. So um, they're all named suburbs and quite small numbers. 
So when you think typically of a suburb, these are smaller, but the names they've used um, make sense to people. And then we took uh, where people said they'd flown and we overlaid the Airshare airspace map to work out whether people are flying where they should be or potentially um, where they shouldn't be. And in the report, we referred to this as flying in restricted airspace, which we did not intend to be a pejorative term. Um, merely, we were trying to find a term that kind of encompassed all of the different areas that we had included. And just to give you an idea on this next slide. So based on that analysis, where we overlaid the airspace map with where people said they flew, we've got nearly a quarter of people, so 24%, who potentially flew in restricted airspace. So what we've termed restricted airspace. Um, and for that, that means they need to have flown in one of the following areas, uh, a low flying zone, a military operating area within four kilometers of an aerodrome, other authorities areas, control zones and no fly zones. And they also needed to have flown unshielded and not got permission. So even with all of that, we've also referred to this as they may have flown in restricted airspace. And that's because sometimes people make mistakes with um, suburbs. And so there might have been a little bit of misreporting there, but we think this is a pretty good indication of where people are flying. And you'll see there that we've got um, a distribution by age and gender, just so you can compare who's slightly more likely to be flying in that restricted airspace and who's not. So you can see that uh, males 15 to 29, um, there's slightly higher incidence amongst those who are flying in restricted airspace, unshielded without permission, versus those not. So our commercial users, where are they flying? So you'll remember in the last slide that we had nearly half of the recreational users flying over their own backyard. It's only a quarter of commercial users. Um, also got a, quite a few commercial users flying over residential areas, farmland and industrial areas. And we did the same analysis with the airspace map and the suburbs that we did for the recreational users. And you can see there that potentially 21% um, have flown in response in restricted airspace in their last um, couple of flights. Now I'll hand over to my colleague, Nikki, who will take you through the rest of the presentation. Kia ora koutou katoa. Sixty-three percent of commercial users plan to change how they use drones in future. Um, just one percent of them plan to stop, and the main reason for that is cost. Around four in ten intend to use drones more, and three in ten will use drones for new or different purposes. And when we looked at what those new or different purposes were, um, it's clear that they're new or different to the business rather than being innovative um, uses. The main ones relate to the primary industries and for example, spraying crops or um, monitoring stock, but also mapping and surveying are common. We asked commercial users who plan to continue using drones uh, what thing, one thing could be done to make it easier for the business to do so. And this was an open-ended question where people could provide the answers um, using their own words. And as you can see, there were a wide range of responses. 
um, but we've grouped these into um, themes and the main ones um, are changes to the rules and regulations, especially simpl simplification and clarification of the rules, uh, but better training, equipment and information would also help. And here are some examples of their comments and I'll just read out um, one from each of the main themes. Remove the blanket landowner permissions rule and replace it with a rule that requires permission for flights over active dwellings, active worksites or active livestock use. Setting up a training program to train operators as we currently only have a few people who can fly them. Make Airshare live with everyone's drone flights so everyone can see what everyone else is doing, where and when. All three groups of respondents were asked how much they know about the rules and regulations for flying a drone in New Zealand. Uh, most non-users say they aren't aware of the rules and one in three recreational users say they don't know the rules either. While most commercial users say they have at least a basic understanding, uh, not all do. And this suggests that more education is needed across the board. To delve a little deeper into recreational users' perceptions of the rules, uh, for each one, we plotted the percentage that know the rule against the percentage that think the rule is reasonable. And this identified that the least well-known and least reasonable rule is the one about not being able to fly over a national park. Rules that have a clear safety implication are considered the most reasonable overall. For example, not flying near an aerodrome. There's less agreement that the line of sight rule and height rule and needing permission to, uh, before flying over someone's property are reasonable. Recreational users and non-users were shown this simplified list of rules, which is in line with how Civil Aviation Authority communicate them. Um, when we compare the proportion of recreational users that think each rule is reasonable to the proportion of non-users that feel that way, you can see that generally the non-users are more likely to find the rules reasonable, particularly the line of sight rule, not being able to fly over someone's property without permission, in the height restriction rule. We showed all three groups uh, four potential new rules and asked whether or not they were in favour of each. Non-users are generally more in favour of them than the recreational users. Um, most people overall are in favour of geofencing. Uh, less than half of the recreational users are in favour of compulsory training, but the other two groups, um, more of them are. We also gave non-users and recreational users the opportunity to suggest any other changes to the rules in their own words. And the examples given tend to fall into two camps, either stricter rules or more relaxed rules. And the non-users were more inclined to want stricter rules and the recreational users were more inclined to want them relaxed. I'll read out two of the comments which demonstrate different perspectives around the same topic. Drone use needs to be regulated more seriously, especially near people's homes and on other private property. Drones really need to be operated by someone who has a license and there needs to be a way to track a drone that is in the airspace. However, the main issue for me is privacy breaches. And then here's a comment uh, from a drone user. There should be a differentiation in rules for model aircraft flown by members of a club versus a shop bought drone that becomes an intrusion on privacy and an annoyance to the public. Non-users were asked whether they generally have a positive or a negative view about how drones are being operated in New Zealand. 
and they're more likely to have a positive than a negative view overall. Other questions we asked revealed there's widespread support for drones being used for things like search and rescue and emergency services and basically any task that would otherwise be dangerous or difficult for humans to complete themselves. Um, even some of the more futuristic uses like drone taxis and deliveries, at this early stage, we found there is already some level of openness to these among the public. Non-users' view of, views of drones are mainly impacted by what they see in the media, um, not what they personally see or experience in their lives. Uh, this stuff doesn't differ between those who have a positive or negative view about how drones are being operated here in New Zealand. And lastly, there's quite a lot on this chart, but um, the general finding is that non-users feel more concerned about recreational than commercial drone use in terms of the risk posed to their safety um, and the impact on their privacy. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the uh, common run for the presentation. I'm sure you guys find that pretty interesting. Um, we are now going to move into the Q&A session. Uh, as you'll know, leading up to the forum, we asked attendees to send in their questions ahead of time. Um, we've received a few submissions uh, from UAB consultants, commercial operators, uh, an association and two other stakeholders. Uh, on behalf of everyone, I just want to thank those who sent in a submission. Uh, they were very interesting for us to read. For the purposes of the drone forum today, uh, I will be asking the questions of Michael. Uh, in selecting these questions, we took into account the uh, amount of time constraints that we have today. Um, we are aware that we can't answer absolutely everything. However, all those questions that we don't address today, uh, we'll work over the next few weeks to get a reply to these and respond to those submitters. Uh, for the questions today, we're gonna to be answering those that come up the most, uh, and those that we thought would be most poignant for Colma Brunton to answer today. Um, and again, just as a reminder, uh, should you guys have any questions over the um, drone forum, please feel free to send these through to the drones uh, inbox, so the email address, and we can address these at a later stage. So, uh, Michael, what I might do, well, I'll grab a mic, <laughs> and I'll flick around. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so first question. Does the estimated number of people who have used a drone in the last six months include people who have happened to have a go on their mate's drone but are not recreational users? They do. Um, we needed to, well, if it's only a single use, then the answer is no. They're not included in that 2000 um, uh, sorry, that 271,000, but if they've had two goes on their mate's drone, then they are included. And the reason for that is we needed to draw the line somewhere. So it's whether it's a single go, two goes, or um, somebody's used a drone 20 times. We, when defining it, we had to draw the line somewhere. Yeah. Um, so next question. How does Colmar Brunton state that the number of those aged over 75 was negligible and therefore not projected in the results. Yeah, for this one, I definitely stress that there are people over 75 in the survey and their results count just as much as everybody else. But in terms of the projection, which was based on that initial um, sample from the Colmar Brunton research panel that I outlined earlier, in that sample, 
there was nobody who was over 75 who owned a drone um, and had used it in the last six months. So when we were projecting using those results to project to the population, we didn't want to overestimate the numbers by including a portion of the population that we hadn't observed that characteristic we were looking for. So they are over 75. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> so, um, so it is predicted uh, predicted that 200,071, 121, or oh, sorry, I botched that number, um, 271,121 New Zealanders have used a drone mainly for recreational purposes in the past six months. What are the era bounds around this estimate? Mm -hmm. uh, you could have rounded it to make it easier to say, sorry. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, at a population level, the margin of error on that figure is plus or minus 1.44%, um, which in practical terms uh, means that we're 95% confident that the true number of recreational users lies between 211,680 to 329,827. Cool. Um, so next question, page 24 of the report states that 73% of New Zealand's commercial drone New Zealand's commercial drone fleet is manufactured by DGI. However, 49% of the fleet features geofencing as a technology. How do you explain that? Um, the way we asked the question was, which of these features does your drone have? Now, the fact that 51% of people said, that 51% of people didn't select geofencing doesn't mean that 51% of drones don't have geofencing. It means that 51% of drones either don't have geofencing or the user does not know. And we've seen throughout the survey that there wasn't a brilliant knowledge of um, the rules uh, or knowledge of the features that the drones have. And the more somebody used a drone, then the greater the knowledge of their rules tended to be and also the greater the knowledge of their drone. That's fair. Um, okay, so could you please explain why no sources of hard data were used to generate the results, or even as a sanity check? Why were there no subject matter experts or third parties consulted in this construction of the survey or the questions asked in it? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the hard data, um, we've been talking to a couple of industry players um, to try and calibrate what we're seeing in the survey with their data. Uh, one of those industry players thinks the numbers are about right. The other one thinks it might be an overestimate. Um, but the main reason that we haven't relied on that hard data in any way is that data can't be published, that that has been shared with us on a confidential basis. We can't even say um, who we've been talking to. So the whole purpose of doing a survey is we can publish the survey results to give us an estimate. Okay. Um, questions C4, options one, two, five, and eight are all possible to answer either true or false correctly or incorrectly under the provision stated and under the part 101 rules, was this factored into the results? Um, the way we set up those questions was to try and reflect how civil aviation communicates those rules to the, the broader public, which is um, a simplified version of the actual rule. Um, so I can give you a, a couple of examples here. One of the rules uh, under question is we stated in the survey, you can't fly above 120 metres, brackets, 400 feet. Um, now, in Civil Aviation's uh, Fly the Right Way brochure, that's stated as fly no higher than 120 metres, 400 feet above ground level and only in daylight avoiding cloud or fog. Um, so it's the way we stated the rules is fairly close to the way um, Civil Aviation describe them to the general public. Uh, I'd also add with this that we think based on the survey responses that the respondents understood 
um, that we were talking about the rules in general. Because what we saw is, again, the more somebody had been flying a drone or the more they knew about drones, the more likely they were to answer correctly. So we've got a question in the survey, which was, um, do you, who do you fly with? And one of those groups was um, fly within a club or an association. And those people in particular did very well on the rules. So we think the intent worked quite well. And the intent was just to get a broad understanding so we can understand how people, whether people have a broad understanding of the rules and whether they're operating in that the right way, rather than all the ins and outs. Yeah, <laughs> specific detail. Cool. Um, so slide 24 summarizes the make, model and capabilities of commercial drones. 91% of drones are stated as having camera, which implies that 9% do not. Furthermore, 67% are stated as having GPS, GLO, NASS, which implies 33% do not. Do these figures give CIA any concern that the data might be right, not be credible? I think this, the answer to this is similar to the earlier answer. Yep. This is where people um, don't know the capability of their drone. Mm. So there was a high proportion. This, these figures are from the commercial operators, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, the commercial users. Uh, the commercial users, so for instance, the, um, the farmer or the, the teacher, definitely did not have a greater knowledge of their drone as a, what I think of as a commercial operator. So somebody making money from operating the drone by charging somebody else. So it just means that, um, the, it doesn't mean that the drone doesn't have it. It means that they it either it doesn't have it or they don't know. Fair enough. Okay, um, so the survey data includes data from 1,038 people who have not operated a RPAS or have any training or perceivable knowledge about the subject. Why was this? We want to get a sense of what um, non-users thought mm -hmm. as well as the users. So to get a total population level understanding of people's attitudes towards drones. Yeah, and this was um, kind of important too for us from our side of things, just to mm -hmm. understand what um, that sort of social uh, acceptance is at the moment for drones. Um, so uh, the rules state in question C5, oh sorry, the rules stated in question C5 are wrong and that they are incomplete. Asking whether a rule is reasonable is invalid if the rules are, is wrongly stated. Was this factored into the results? Similar to my earlier answer, it's not factored into the results, but the intent was to get a broad understanding of the rules, not the um, all the details or the all the the exclusions that might apply for a rule. So I don't think I don't think that calls into account whether um, asking that rule is reasonable or not yep. is, um, yeah, is relevant. Um, were there any reasonableness, check, reasonable, reasonableness checks performed on the estimated number of commercial organisations using drones for business and scientific purposes? Um, we have talked to those two industry players I mentioned earlier, mm. so that was one check. Uh, we also went through the the data very thoroughly to make sure that um, people who said they were using drones were actually using drones. And then the other one I would mention with this is the survey definition of who a commercial user is is much broader than I think the person who asked that question was thinking about. So it includes those school teachers, it includes the real estate agents, it includes the farmers and the horticulturists yeah. and the professional photographers. Yeah. Uh, regarding slide 16, it is unlikely that an organisation has gone to the effort of becoming a part 102 uh, would operate under part 101 as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think of some of the people who might have selected part 101 and part 102 may have been thinking to themselves, oh, or I use a drone for commercial purposes. Again, coming back to the, somebody who's not using it that often, 
Um, I'm not sure what I should be, what rules I should be flying under. I'm going to select both of those. So I don't think it calls into account the accuracy of the data. I think it just reminds us that a lot of people don't know the rules. Yeah, understandable. Um, why is restricted airspace being confused with control zones and other types of special use airspace? Mm -hmm. Was this a decision to use the term restricted airspace rather than using a more neutral term that describes the category of airspace more honestly? Um, the decision to use restricted airspace was completely ours, so Colmar Brunton's. Uh, we thought it was a neutral term. We didn't mean it in a negative sense. Mm. Um, we thought briefly about using uh, controlled and uncontrolled airspace, um, but we thought that might get confused with control zone because our definition, as set out in the report, is much broader than just a control zone. And also, if we're referring to uncontrolled airspace, um, we we're also concerned that maybe if the general public sees the report, that they're going to become concerned that there's uncontrolled airspace in New Zealand and become worried. So yep. we, we chose it because we thought it was neutral. Um, it turns out it wasn't interpreted always that way, but that's that was the intent. Yeah, that's understandable. Uh, regard, regarding proposed policies, was there any consideration given to asking whether the response would have been the same if the option was of no effect or partially effective. If these questions were not asked, what, what does this imply about bias in the survey outcomes? Um, that wasn't considered. Um, I don't think it implies bias though to figure in whether people think a policy will work or not. Mm. Um, it was more, we were just interested in whether people were broadly in favour of these or not. Yep. I think figuring out whether they would work is, would be further down the track. It's a big question. Uh, when looking at the type of airspace that recreational and commercial users flew in, there are superficial differences between commercial and recreational users. The headline of the relevant slides is that more than one in five recreational flights and one in five commercial flights. The respective numbers are 21% and 23%. Are these different statistics, are these different, is this difference statistically, oh, is this difference statistically significant? Uh, do they, do the differences in terminology justify the difference in the slide title? Um, I think it might be 21 and 24%, I think, I think right. in memory. <laughs> um, I'd need to go back and check that. But this that's just what our convention is in research when referring to results. Sure. Um, and given that they're on two separate slides, mm. we didn't look to see whether they were significantly different or not. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they are, but it's more, it's just one is closer to 25 and the other one is closer to um, 20%, so that's sure. just, our, just our research convention. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, why were commercial drone users excluded from analysis on slides 50 to 53? So those slides were feelings of recreational and non-users. Um, because of we were trying to keep our questionnaires under a certain length, we couldn't ask all the questions of all the people. Yep. So we had to make some trade-offs about what questions we asked of each group and we had to prioritise them. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't ask those questions of commercial drone users. Sure. Um, how long was the survey in the end? The... I think it was about 15 minutes. I would need to look that up. That's okay. <laughs> Not a worry. Um, <laughs> so it is interesting to see that one of the most commercially used DGI S series of the larger APAS is missed from your survey altogether. It is also interesting to note that Freefly, being the world leader in TV and film, is also missing from this category. And yet consumer models like GoPro have made the selection. Um, what's in the report is the more frequently occurring models. And there's a big category called other. So the DJI 
S series is definitely in the other category because mm. there weren't that many of them. Um, free fly, I think I remember also being in that category. I'm not 100% sure. Sure. Um, and the reason that the likes of GoPro have made this selection is because we have that broad definition of who a commercial user is. Why was the potentially inaccurate Airshare website used to classify airspace rather than a visual navigation chart? Uh, the reason we chose Airshare was we wanted to use the airspace that most drone users were being directed to. So civil aviation directs people to Airshare. Mm -hmm. And I believe it is as up to date as possible. I think it's a, a good reflection. And we actually did that same analysis on the um, the more official map, mm -hmm. and it didn't really change the percentages very much at all. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's um, also an app that a lot of people, sort of recreational users, use as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, it makes sense. Right. Um, this is our final question. <laughs> so uh, small and cheap are no relevance to safety at all. An eighty-nine dollar Arpez that collides with manned aviation will have the same outcome as a $4,000 RPAS of the same mass. Mm -hmm. What's your answer to that? Um, the only reason we've profiled the size and the make of drone and what it costs is just out of interest to understand the New Zealand drone market and what's operating. Yeah. Um, there is no um, statement about the relationship between size and mm -hmm. cost and the safety and how safely it's operated. Yeah, or the sense. potential risk it causes. Awesome. Right. Well, <laughs> that brings us to the end of the questions. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Kirsty Hewlett, who will give us a bit of a uh, government update. Um, I will change the slides over. To, um, okay. Tina Koto Kautua. For some of you that don't know me, um, I'm Kirsty Hewlett and I'm the Deputy Chief Executive for System and Regulatory Design at the Ministry of Transport. I'm also the Chair for the Government's Cross-Agency Work on Drones. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge Michael and Nikki and thank them for presenting the findings today. It was a very interesting presentation. Um, and I'm pleased to see the level of interest in the survey and great to see so many people online today. I hope you all found it informative and, uh, and we answered all of the questions you might have had. Um, I also, we also just wanted to appreciate the flexibility you've shown um, given the COVID environment um, and uh, participating by webinar today. As Dean mentioned, the survey was commissioned to increase our understanding of the drone environment in New Zealand. Gathering evidence and reliable data relating to drone use is particularly difficult um, at the moment, particularly given the absence of systems we have for collecting data directly from the source. This survey gives us a much better idea of who and what is flying, why they are flying, and how they are using drones and what the general public thinks about drones. We acknowledge that these results don't tell us everything and like every survey, it has some limitations. But the, the survey does give us really good data to build our understanding on the size and complexity of the sector and the public's perception of drones. We'll take the results of the survey and we'll combine it with any other data sets we have on drones like the administrative data we get from the CAA, Airways, Statistics New Zealand and the industry, and we'll pull that together to inform all of our ongoing work streams. The government is committed to enabling a thriving and innovative drone sector in New Zealand, which interfaces and works well with our current aviation sector. We see drones as an enabling technology which can help lift productivity across the economy. This is more than and more important than ever, given the economic challenges that we're all facing now and over the next few years. So this survey is another step towards better understanding on what we need to do to capture the benefits of drones in New Zealand. And in, the, in light of that, um, my job is to give you an update on the cross-government work programme and touch on how this survey will be used in the context of that work. So first of all, with the Ministry of Transport, 
we have been busy progressing our review of the current regulatory framework applicable to drone operations. So late last year, we engaged with key stakeholders to test our early thinking on possible regulatory options around things like registration, pilot competency, and remote identification. The responses we see received from people were largely positive, and the feedback's been taken into account um, for our ongoing policy development. So the work we're doing now is to take the initial work that was done and the engagement and take this a step further, looking at the detail around a compulsory drone registration or notification, qualification and testing for part 101 pilots, and technical requirements around remote remote identification and geo awareness. The review will also look um, at a range of general rule updates, such as looking at potential changes to the consent provisions. The, not just the engagement to date, but other data, and then this survey um, has helped us to better understand behavioural patterns of users in the public and what drones are used for and what could actually work in a legal, regulatory and technical sense. What we're hoping to do is to plan or pull all of this work together into a detailed discussion document, which depending on the election, um, we're hoping to release at the end of this year um, for a much more detailed and comprehensive discussion of the issues. While we're doing that work, we've also been undertaking in parallel a bit of a look at unmanned aircraft traffic management, UTM, as a potential solution for drone integration this is still at a very early stage and we're focused on really understanding what the key components of a UTM system would look like and how can UTM contribute to the safe integration of drones. We're also looking at what the key um, government objectives or principles should be for underpinning the system and the role different government entities and the private sector organisations should play in developing and implementing a UTM. We're undertaking a bit of preliminary engagement with agencies and key aviation partners on this at the moment to come to a clear view on where to start and how to take this work forward. Again, some of the data that you heard in the survey today will help us better understand the size and characteristics of the drone sector in New Zealand and what this means for the needs of a UTM system. The CAA has, of course, been helping us with most of the work that I talked about before, um, but has also um, launched its new safety campaign, Share the Skies, last week. This is a new education initiative focused on safe drone use under the existing rules. This survey has been critical to informing the demographic targeting of this campaign and the messages in it. The Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment has also been leading its Airspace Integration Trials Program, or AITP. This program has a vision to make New Zealand the location of choice for the safe development, testing and market validation of advanced drones and adjacent technologies. As such, again, the information presented around commercial drone use in particular will be of interest to MB. We think the data clearly indicates the importance that commercial operators, particularly those playing under part 102 rules, place on the con contribution drones make to their profitability and productivity. The survey information showing how in the future businesses plan to use drones across a range of use cases allows MB to consider whether to, where to best focus its R&D support and efforts to maximise the benefits of developing the drone industry. MB understands that public knowledge of and attitudes towards drone usage is a key enabler to increasing public acceptance of drones. These findings allow us to better understand current public perceptions and which medians have the most influence on, on changing and working with these perceptions. This will hopefully mean um, that MB and the AITP can better communicate drone related information to the public and subsequently support the development of New Zealand's drone industry. You would have also seen earlier in the year that the government announced its partnership with WISC as part of the airspace integration trials program. They are the first member of this program and you'll see other partners um, to be announced soon. So finally, um, if you've got remaining questions or comments either on the quick, up, very quick update I just gave or the survey, please feel free to send these through to the drone's email address at the Ministry of Transport. 
And once again, I'd just like to thank Colmore Brunton for their work on the survey and the presentation. And I'd like to extend my thanks to other agencies for being present today and helping answer some of the questions. Finally, thank you all for your participation. I hope the survey will also be useful for you as much as it is for us. Hey, Koneira. Goodbye. Right. Uh so we've sped through the presentation today. Um, obviously, I think if it had been in person, it might have been a bit longer, with a bit more interaction. Um, however, uh, we've come to the end of uh, the forum today. Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone here, obviously, uh, Kirsty, um, and thank you, Dean, for coming along and having a chat, and also Colmar Brunton. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, as Kirsty said, if there's any more questions, uh, we're happy to answer them through the drones uh, email inbox. And apart from that, We'll let you get on with the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>